Will you stand with me? <clears throat> a question on the uh, PCA elders, uh, one of the boards online, they said, does your congregation stand for scripture reading? And then they listed out a survey of which ones and, you know, all of them, this and, and just when it's comfortable. <laughs> and um, it made me pause and remind myself why we stand here, why we stand for the call to worship. Um, and we don't stand for every time I mention scripture because some of us impromptu. I'm just reading it. But in the Old Testament, Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, they stood and they stood for the reading of God's word. We stand out of honor. Because we're standing before our holy God. This is not me or another ruling elder reading from some ancient text. That has a lot of good wisdom in it. This is the word of the living God, the only true God. And it is for you today to hear. You're not here by some accident or some mistake. You're here because God drew you today. That's the only way. Hear now the reading of God's word from 1 Timothy we will pick up in verse 8. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, let it wash over us like your word washed over Paul on the road to Damascus and afterward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you remember last week, we spoke about this evidence of good doctrine. Do you remember what the evidence, now don't call it out because one, I don't want you to be embarrassed in front of everybody if you've forgotten. No, but do we remember what the evidence, one evidence of a good, of a, of a place of, of worship and teaching having sound doctrine? What is, what is the evidence of that? There's many evidences, but one of them is fruit, fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is holiness, uh, morals, moral living, but more importantly, faith and love flow amongst the body when there is solid teaching. Um, now, teaching, now, last week I talked about, or Paul talked about, and I expounded upon it, um, false teachers teaching doctrine that wasn't true. There was another element in there of, of myths and things that they were talking about. And he didn't necessarily say they were all untrue. So we have kind of two categories. People who were teaching things that are just simply not true of the gospel and about Jesus. And then some who were just distracting people and getting them off base and talking about things that intellectually stimulating, but of no value when it comes to the gospel. So teaching, proclamation, <coughs> um, a, a body that centered on, on teaching that it's not centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ eventually leads to a loveless and a faithless community. Um, why? Because God is the source of both faith and love. 
If you've been coming on Sunday evenings, we've been going through 1 John, and this past Sunday, John said something very profound that you have heard before, probably. God is love, which means he is the, if he is love, he is the source of love, the fountainhead of love. Where does your faith come from? Ephesians said, your faith in Christ comes as a gift from God. So the fountain and source of faith and love is God through Jesus Christ, and he comes to us. Now, as we begin to pull away from that, and our doctrine begins to either become false doctrine or just distracting things that we talk about that aren't of a lot of value, then we begin to disconnect from the source. You ever had an electronic where you unplug it, and there's a split second where the lights are still on, and you think, what just happened? It's still got a little bit of power in it. Its capacitors or its power source is storing it up and it stays on for a few moments. And then it powers down. That is the church that becomes infiltrated by wolves that begins to have people that are Christians leave and you start to get disconnected from the source. And even in that church, believers, the love of Christ and the faithfulness towards Christ starts to fade because they have been disconnected from that power source. It's not an immediate thing. It's not an immediate thing, but it will happen. So today, that, that was addressing false teaching and errant teaching and how it impacts the community. Today, Paul, in the next couple of verses, looks to the teachers. And, and while this was talking to the teachers, talking to Timothy, saying, hey, look for people that will teach truth, he says, also examine the teachers. Because if they're living an immoral life, they're living life that is godless, it will eventually impact their doctrine. It will change how they think and how they function and how they teach and what they teach. So last week, the title of the sermon was Stay on Mission. And it was Paul's fatherly counsel of how to nurture the church, keep them focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today... The title of the sermon is Embrace the Message of the Mission, essentially. See, doctrine impacts the community's life. The life of the teacher impacts their doctrine. So Paul starts this in verse 8, and he says, um, we all know that the law is good. You know the law is good, right? If you're a Christian, you go, the law of God is good. Um, and it's, it's striking to me that we've, over the last several years, begun to say that law enforcement in America, they're the problems, the ones who enforce the law, because it's the exact reversal of what God has been saying is pre- keeping law is good. Now, when laws become immoral, and, and you, can, you can have a big debate over that, but God says, my law is perfect. My law is good. My law is holy. And he says, um, when... It is used correctly when it's used lawfully, okay? When the law is used correctly, it ought to actually bring freedom. And you go, wait a minute. When we think of the law out here, when it's used correctly, it puts people in jail. I'm tired of them letting those people off that that deserve to be in jail and it's not being used correctly. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. When the law is used correctly, it prevents people from go- having to go to jail. When the law is used correctly, it looks at you and says, if you do this, you will be punished. And people go, I don't want to be punished, so I will stay away from doing that. Bring that concept into the church. The law says, if you sin, you will die. The gospel says, God has a solution for that. So when Paul says the law needs to be used appropriately, he says the teachers were, were instead of bringing people to this state of freedom, the shackles have been freed. I am no longer under the curse and penalty of the law, so much so that I'm fleeing anything that is unlawful. He says they were putting shackles on people with their teaching and never getting to the gospel of grace. And he said, even worse, the reason they were doing that is because their lives had become so corrupt that they had lost the message that they were teaching. They weren't embracing it themselves. 
God expects holiness. You must be holy. And then they would walk off and live in deep unholiness. That began to impact their teaching so that they never got to the gospel of grace. He said, this is a pattern. He says, Timothy, watch the message, but also keep an eye on the messenger. Because someone who's teaching good, if they live in corruption, will eventually slide and fade away from that good teaching. Graceless teaching of the law leads to guilt, leads to, then leads to condemnation, and then stops right there with hopelessness. But the gospel and grace comes over top of that and says your condemnation is gone because Jesus Christ has covered your sin with his blood. He has taken the penalty of your sin by dying on the cross in your place. Grace equals freedom. So, in verse 9, he tells us what a lawful use of the, I mean, a lawless use of the law, and, and, and really, he tells us what, the, what people look like here. He says, um, the law is for the lawless and the disobedient. Um, it's not laid down for the just. Here's the thing we've got to understand. This is not trying to say that Christians don't need to know about the law or ever talk about the law. Paul has a very focused context here. We talked about it last week. The context is verse 7. Teachers of the law were teaching without understanding what it is they were teaching. They were coming in as law teachers, and, and, and teachers of the laws is the terminology they used in Judaism because they, they had the law. They were the ones, they were the teachers but Paul would even expand that to say now the teachers of the gospel. That's the way we would talk about it. But he said these people that are coming in to teach the good news of Jesus Christ, they don't even understand what it is they're teaching. They, they so much don't understand it. He says that in verse 9, they're actually very lawless themselves in their lives. The law is not for those who have submitted to God in the same way that it is for those who have not submitted to God. The law, first and foremost, is meant to convict those who are dead in their trespasses and sins that have come alive and uh, by the Spirit. It now convicts them, and then the gospel comes in and woos them to salvation in Christ. You see, these people were speaking of the need for holiness while living in deep unholiness. They had not adopted the message that they proclaimed, God demands obedience. That's what they were proclaiming. And ultimately, their lives had blinded them to the proper use of the law that they even taught. The law was always intended to free people from slavery to sin. We go, what about Moses when he gave the Ten Commandments? They were expected to follow that, and that was not freedom. It absolutely was freedom, because what came shortly thereafter? The ceremonial law that had blood sacrifices, that had the Holy of Holies eventually, that had the, the scapegoat. And it was a communication that you're dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has a plan to fix all of this and fix and resolve the cursed world. Do you want to be a part of that? And Israel said, I do. Yes, please let me partake of the solution that God has designed. So the law from the very beginning, was intended to free people from slavery to sin. You don't believe that that's God is, God's intent with everything? Pastors, theologians will point you back to Genesis chapter 3 and, and where Adam and Eve fell. And all of a sudden, where they once walked in the garden in peace, they're now hiding because they're naked, they're ashamed, they realize that they've done something to offend God, they hear God walking, and then they lie to God. I didn't do it, she did it. Never heard that one, have you? Never thought that you wanted to lie, did you? Could you imagine standing before God and lying? Does anybody catch what I just said? You really do that every day. God's here. I <laughs> gotcha. Um, that's why we need the grace of God. And what did he do to Adam and Eve? He clothed, clothed, clothed that's a tough word to say, them with the skin of animals. He, he, he covered their nakedness. He covered their shame. Evangel uh, 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 pastors and theologians will tell you that that is the proto-evangelium, the, the first picture of the gospel. God is showing them, I am going to take care of your shame. 
I am going to take care of your guilt. And the rest of the story of Scripture is about how to get freedom. The first step of that is to realize I need freedom. To realize I'm enslaved to sin. Slave is, sin is, I love it. I actually hate the things of God. We'd never admit it that way. But that's the heart that's there when we're born. And then the Holy Spirit changes us, gives us a new heart. And we start going, you know what? I kind of like the things that God's laying down. I'm interested in them. How do, how do I get a, to be a part of that? Paul says that's where they stop because they don't know. They don't know the things that they're teaching. So he goes on and he lists out the types of sins they were involved in. We're going to, if I have time at the end of the sermon, we'll get into the details of these, but I'm going to kind of fly through them right now. He says, the law is laid down for the lawless and the disobedient, for the God, ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the profane. One commentator said, if you'll notice here, you kind of have Paul using the Ten Commandments and the structure of the Ten Commandments. All of those initial sins listed were about man's unholy relationship to God. The second part turns to man's unholy relationship with fellow man. The law is for those who strike their fathers and their mothers, for the murderers, for the sexually immoral, for the men who practice homosexuality, for enslavers, for liars, for perjurers. And, and Paul just says, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. <clears throat> so Paul's not listing off a list of the only sins in the world, but he's listing off a good list to show some very terrible, horrible sins. He is trying to say, these are really, really bad. I listed these because, Timothy, I want you to know, if you see people involved in these things, it's really bad. And they're probably, there's no way they're going to be able to sustain in teaching sound doctrine to the people of God. He says, whatever is contrary to, the, to sound doctrine. And what Paul is trying to explain here, he says, if you see someone who is progressing in sin rather than progressing in repentance, then that person is falling into this idea that they have not embraced the message of the gospel and that their lack of repentance will negatively impact the truth that they teach, their doctrine. Now, what is doctrine? Just to kind of make sure everybody's clear on that. I keep using that word. The doctrine is the beliefs of a certain group of people. Theology is the study of God from which our doctrine comes. You've heard of doctrinal statements. That is a statement of a church about a specific thing or topic. And Paul is saying what their lives are not just, um, it, it, it's their way of living in the, these sins is hostile to the truth. It's not some neutral thing that you can just keep on living. He says what they're proclaiming, they don't even understand because they, it's, not, it's not having an impact on their lives. One of the things you learn in seminary, and, and really, I'll tell you, you, you're told this in seminary, you learn it as a pastor and a preacher. When the truth that you're teaching really hits home for you, that's when you preach it most powerfully. When you believe it and it, and it impacts you personally, is when, you, when it really becomes the power to the people that are hearing. So what Paul is saying is that their teaching, or their, their way of life is contrary to the gospel, meaning it's going to drive them away from sound doctrine. Paul is warning Timothy about this. And he tells them, look for people who embrace the gospel. So, we had um, last week stay on mission. And then Paul is telling Timothy, look for people that embrace the message, but not just the message that they're teaching, not just people that are teaching morals and are moral lives. Have they embraced the message of the church, the message of the gospel? Does their teaching begin with law and end with grace? And is it covered with grace all the way through? Or are they just putting shackles on, its, on their hearers, locking them down with guilt and fear, and a spirit of anger. Embrace the gospel. You see, teachers of the law, not living by the law, have not embraced the message of the gospel. And I'm not talking about perfection here, or Paul's not talking about perfection here. 
He's taught when he when he distinguished between lawless and righteous at the beginning of this section, he was saying those who have embraced Jesus Christ and are repenting continually and regularly of sin that comes into their life, fighting against sin, but versus those who have just said, I don't really care. I don't I'm not worried about angering the Almighty God. So how do we use the law lawfully? We talked about it, but Paul gets very explicit here. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul says the law must be used in accordance with the gospel or it is being misused. It is not, it is not being used as a deterrent to going to jail. It is being used to badger people and throw them in jail and put them in shackles, not to teach them and draw them away from that end. And then Paul goes into another kind of related topic or the, or the, or the, the really the crux of his message. I thank God who's given strength to me because he judged me faithful. Now, this is not Paul being the Pharisee going, Sure, I'm glad I'm not like those evil, wicked sinners. You could read it that way. That's not what he's saying. He says, I thank God he, that he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service because I was worse than those people. The reason I highlighted the fact that those sins were so bad, some of you might have thought, well, here we go, railing against homosexuality. He put homosexuality in there and he calls it the worst. I'm not, Paul was trying to list out and say, look, these are the types of things you've got to root out, Timothy. And you've got to see that they're not preaching the gospel. They may sound good to the ears. They may be talking about the holiness of God, but they're leaving the good news that Jesus Christ has forgiven us of all those things in his death and resurrection. They're leaving that off. And he says, you can see it partly by the way they're living their lives. You do not let those people in. And he says, I know this is powerful and I know this is true because I was worse than every single one of them. You remember what Paul was doing? He was rounding up God's family and killing them because they joined God's family. We would say the church, but we just went through the communicants lesson. I had to go through it with my kids this week. And the one thing it says is, what is the church? It is God's family. You have been adopted. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been adopted into the family of God. And Paul said, I'm a Jew of Jews. I will have none of this because God's family is not Christ. God's family is Judaism. And he was out getting letters from, from the Romans and going and hunting people down. And he said, I was the chief of sinners. I was the worst of the worst. I was violently an aggressor towards the church. I was living as contrary to the gospel as you could live because I was trying to snuff it out. Yet... I was shown mercy. And Timothy, let me tell you what that mercy does to you. It whips you out of the passions and lusts of this life. It changes you. Does it do everything and resolve everything overnight? No, but it progressively pulls you out of a life that is dead, a life of a blasphemer, it pulls you out of that. And, and he said, these people, that's not what they're doing. He says, they're not of God. He says, that grace so overflowed for me. It wasn't a trickle of grace going, well, I'll give you a little bit. You're terrible. But here, he said, you would not, I can't under, you can't understand. I was murderously going to kill people. God struck me blind. And when I come awaken and I've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, I've met Christ, I now walk into that same community of people 
that I had every intention of murdering. And I walked in trusting God that they would not kill me. Step by step. Fearful. He didn't tell us he was fearful necessarily, but could you imagine? They did say, I don't know that we should let this guy in. He trusted they were kind people. He, he, had, he had seen what was in their hearts because he now had it in his heart. And he said, Timothy, that's who you want leading your church. The man who has been changed, who has been transformed, not one who is clinging to worldliness while just trying to get the fame of leading a body of people. Paul had found the faith and love, the only only kind that can only be found in Christ. <clears throat> when Paul lived contrary to the gospel, his doctrine reflected that. When Paul lived contra- according to the gospel, his doctrine changed. He said, Timothy, learn from me. Paul experienced grace. Then he started to teach about grace. Paul warns Timothy about those who show no evidence of God's grace having impacted their lives. All right, I have a few more minutes. You're like, great, I thought we were done. But I, this, this is good stuff. Let's, we're we're going to go through those sins real quickly. That's practical application for today. If we were to go and say, what are we looking for in church leaders? What are we looking for in our own lives? He talks about murderers. The context of this, remember, Jesus has already given his teaching on murder. He says, you've heard it said that you shall not murder, but um, Jesus equated anger with murder. He says the the core kernel of murder is anger. He says, I'm trying to go for the heart. I want to root. What I want you to understand, church, is that I'm not here to just make the place a little better. I'm here to eradicate anything that is ungodly. That kernel nugget of anger in you, I want it gone. And it will be gone. But do you understand that even when you're slightly anger, angry, you're as guilty as a murderer? He says, God's people are not characterized by anger. Their teachers cannot be characterized by anger. But what does the world say to us today? Oh, that's just being a little kid when he kicks back at his mom and he fights back. A child's outrage is not just being a child. A teenager's angst towards their parents is not just being a teenager. It is sinful activity worthy and accountable to God for all the eternal punishment that he will bring down upon us. We ought to quit acting like it's not. And then offer grace, repent, turn back from that way of life, he says, and you will be forgiven. So, Timothy, don't Don't bring in and allow a bunch of angry people, murderers who strike their moms and their fathers with words and with an actual striking out and killing them. Do not bring those people into the church as leaders. The sexually immoral, the word there you've heard it said is pornos, which is related to our word for pornography. It's this idea of immoral is, is the idea of not conforming to God's standard of sex and the sexual relationship. Here's the thing that we never talk a lot about, and I'm sure everybody loves to have their pastor up here talking about this. The sexual relationship, though, is good and holy. It is designed by God He says, what did he say? Be fruitful. He encourages it. Be fruitful and multiply. It is a holy thing. It is a good thing when done in the context that God has laid it out for. The unlawful use of the sexual relationship is when you go beyond the bounds of what God allows into the unholy. He says, and and." What he goes in in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, he gives kind of this list of things. That, you know, you're all these different people that should not have these relationships. But when you when you get down to it, he he tells us something else about the the sexual relationship. He says, husband and wife, when you come together, you're coming together as one, and we call that the consummation of a marriage. And he said, and 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 that is the point that you're joining as one. Something is different in a relationship when that occurs. That's why adultery 
is so damaging to the, to the life of the family, to the relationship, because you are joining in a, in a special way to another person or to multiple people. And he says, that shall not be so. Who and, and how and when can that relationship occur? When you have stood before a holy God with someone beside you, a woman beside you as a man or vice versa, and made a commitment till death do us part because we are joining as one. And the consummation of the marriage is the final act of coming together in a way and doing and sharing something that you share with no other person in the entire creation. And we go, nah, just whenever you feel old enough or you feel like you've got the right person, the world is killing us with ignorance, stupidity, and lies. And I've been a young person and we're eating it up and we're believing it. And when you get into your adult life, it doesn't just disappear. It stays with you. It impacts you. I promise you, those who have not walked into this sexual immorality that Paul's talking about, fight it. Fight it. You will be forever thankful when you become a married person with a spouse. Sexual immorality is perversion of that which is holy when done in the right ways that God ordains. Homosexuality is a perversion not of the holy, of the natural created order. It's on a different layer, a different level. Um, talking to one of my children the other day about, we, we, we don't talk about this often, but it came up. Um, it, it comes up more than you want it to because of TV shows. Actually, it comes up quite often now that I admit it. It's all over the place before us. That's why the church is talking about it so much. People think, y'all hate homosexuals, you hate gay people, and you're we're not ranting and raving. We're trying to keep sound doctrine because the wolves have gotten in to eat us alive, and they're stealing people away by, by encouraging these immoral, uh, these unnatural lusts in their hearts that they're starting to maybe contemplate. People are coming in going, that's fine, chase it, go for it, because God is okay with it. And what happens is this is a perversion of the natural created order. So the conversation I was having with my child, they said, how do people not just look at their bodies and go, we're not designed that way? It, it, you know, everybody has said that, right? The problem is it's not a perversion of something that is holy and good when used properly. It is a perversion of the natural created order. It's looking at God going, why did you make me this way? You messed us up. I love this person, but my body is not compatible with this person, so I can't have all the things that I would want to have from that, children and whatnot, and all of that. It is a perversion of the natural order. It's on a different level of sexual immorality. If it were not, why would Paul really list it out? I think definitely here. Now, here's the argument that I saw, one, one of the many arguments that people come at this, and they say, well... If you look at the King James and you look at other versions of the English Bible, they don't even put the word homosexual there. They didn't have that concept there. And they say the reason being <coughs> is that Paul made this word up. Arsinakoitias. That was a great Greek pronunciation. Don't look it up. Um, I, was, I, was, I wrote it in the Greek for some reason. So I was like, How did, I, I don't even know if I got it right. Um, Paul made this word up. And what, what the argument is, you don't see this word anywhere else in Scripture, really. And so Paul just made it up. And it's clearly that the two words mean men and bed. That, that, that's, the, that's the concept. But they said, well, since Paul made it up, how do we know the context for what he really meant by this? Well, if your doctrine's not sound and your life is not in line with the gospel, that argument sounds pleasing, sounds good. It supports your position. But um, Kevin DeYoung, an article written uh, probably around 2014, I went back and saw, he says um, that word is actually taken from Leviticus 20. So, you know, I said Leviticus 18 and 20 talk about the perversions of relationships and things like this. 
And in the two words, men and bed or whatever, however it's put together, he says, if you go back to Leviticus, which was written in Hebrew, but he says there's this little thing called the Septuagint where they translated the Hebrew Bible into the Greek before, way before Paul existed, or you know, right, it was coming up to where he was. It says in Leviticus 20, verse 13, in the Septuagint, the two words Paul used literally are right side by side, two separate words. So what Paul's doing, DeYoung argues, is he's not using some new word that has no context for meaning. He's directly taking them back to Leviticus 20 because his hearers would have known Leviticus 20, would have understood it, and they would have said, oh, he's talking about men and unnaturalness. And he said the context of Leviticus 20 is very clear and obvious. He said Paul is wholeheartedly leaning upon that. It's like if I looked at you and I said, this new video game is um, not very video gamey. I just made that word up. I don't know if it's in the dictionary. It might probably is now that I say this. But you understand what I mean. This video game, using two words that I've just used that you understand, it's not like what I would expect a video game to be like. It's more realistic than a video game usually is. He says that's what Paul was really doing here, using something they would understand to drive his point home, not just to use a word about two men cannot have relationships, two women can't have relationships. He's saying they were breaking Leviticus 20. That was the problem. And they're wanting to come in and be teachers in the church. Can't be. This subject of homosexuality has thrown our world into utter chaos. But the church is required to be vocal about it because we have to defend sound doctrine. I mentioned these wolves that have come into churches and they've devoured the sheep, encouraging others to embrace these unnatural desires. And those churches, whether they know it or not, are drifting far from God. Doctrine and, and morals and life follow one another. But the true teachers will denounce these unnatural desires. Here's where it really impacts our denomination. We've had a lot of kerfuffle about what we should do and how we should handle this. But one of the arguments that sticks out is they, they keep saying, you have people in your churches struggling with this. You can't just stand up in the pulpit and rant and rave about how terrible they are. Is that not what Paul is just saying right here? Preach the gospel. So if there's anybody hearing my voice, anybody who watches this recording later, anybody in this room, anybody who has friends and family that's struggling with this, the sinner is always welcomed into the church on God's terms. In God's terms, don't say to walk into this building, you've got to be perfect. Because if he did, if it did, I would empty every one of us out right now in, a, in obedience to God. It doesn't even say you have to be good. It actually says you have to recognize your wretchedness and fight against it. Repent. And don't just repent, though. Seek help repenting. The argument is that because it was such a well-known um, sin received across the board, even in society, they went, That's not a, we're not going to deal with that. We don't want that to be even welcomed in society. People who had these interests, they hid. They hid scared. And it percolated. And it percolated. And it grew. And the desires became stronger and came stronger. But I'm calling out to you today, trust in Christ so he can save your soul and sanctify your body. So what do we mean by trusting Christ? This is not just for homosexuality, but it's definitely something that's relevant for today. Do not walk this walk alone. The church is not meant to badger people who walk in sin. That only leads to death. The church leads to life. A loving church family can help when the mind is gripped by the Spirit of God. If you're struggling with any of these sins, especially homosexuality in today's world, don't go seek answers from the internet. Don't go seeking answers from those who are telling you that God's okay with that sin. These people have it all wrong. Come to your loving church family as fearful and scary as that might be, 
Come to an elder. Come to your parents. Come to someone and say, I need help. What does Scripture say? Help my unbelief. And it's true of any sin. It's true of any desire that's, that you're afraid is going to take you to sin. Until it comes to light, nobody can help you. Paul was the chief of sinners, he says. And then he was promoted to a chief position in Christendom as an apostle. Not the chief, a chief, a high position. Do you think God doesn't want to fix you, help you, save you, pull you out of sin? Whatever sin you're in today, He doesn't want you fighting it alone. He wants you to find someone to work with, to, to, to be encouraged by. Peace is possible. Do not hide. Embrace the message. The chief of sinners says he found grace overflowing. How? When he was struck blind, met Christ, and went into the community of Christ and shared his story, shared what he had done, what he was coming out of, shared his need for love and help and kindness and, and, and went away for a couple of years to, to hear and to, to be refreshed. There's enough grace to restore his life, he said. There was enough grace to restore his joy. There was enough grace to restore his peace. There was enough grace to restore his God. You too can have that. Let the law convict you unto repentance in Christ and receive the grace and peace that is offered through Jesus. Let's pray. Oh God, help us. We're all in need. Many are hiding, afraid of being exposed. God, we will all be exposed on that last day. And the things we hide today are hurting us. Help us. Help our unbelief. Help us trust you. Help us trust one another just as Paul trusted when he walked into those communities of Christ. He trusted you and he trusted them. Help us to have that same trust. Through the power of Christ we pray. Amen.